afternoon, and thank you for joining us in today's webinar, Translating Military Documents to Award Appropriate Academic Credit. Special thanks goes to Luminous Foundation and Strata Education Network who have supported our efforts. My name is Sarah Appel, and I'm the MCMC Manager at the Western Higher Education Compact, and I will be today's moderator. Just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, questions will be done through the chat feature, and we will do follow-up throughout the presentation as necessary. A brief overview of the MCMC. The mission of the Multi-State Collaborative on Military Credit is to facilitate an interstate partnership of 13 states and to translate competencies acquired by veterans through military training and experiences toward college credentials. States exchange information and share best practices in the areas of articulation of credit, certification and licensure, communication, and data and technology. Our three project goals are assist states and post-secondary institutions in aiding military-connected students with critical life transitions from the military to post-secondary education and then from post-secondary education to civilian employment. Increase post-secondary education completion rates by creating models for the consistent, transparent, and effective awarding of credit for military training and experience that can be scaled regionally and nationally, thereby lowering the cost of education and reducing the time to completion. Establish a strong network of support, communication, documentation, and data collection among institutions and organizations for the purpose of promoting shared interests and tracking the efficacy of efforts to enhance military-connected students' educational success. We have four knowledge communities in MCMC. We have articulation of academic credit, communication and outreach, data systems and technology, and licensure and certification. We are joined today and happy to have with us Jared Shank, who's the Director of Military and Apprenticeship Initiatives and Special Projects at the Ohio Department of Higher Education. So, Jared, I will let you take it over. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, uh, welcome again. <laughs> uh, as I was uh, just saying while I was on mute, I uh, volunteered to chair the academic credit group. And I thought that it would be good to reach out and do a uh, webinar, kind of a broad-based uh, webinar that gets a little bit into the weeds of military credit. Um, so this isn't really uh, Ohio-focused, per se. It's kind of really for anybody who wants to just learn a little bit more about this. Um, so I wanted to give some examples, a little bit of an overview. So we're going to talk about the, uh, the Joint Service Transcript. Uh, that is the transcript that's available for the, uh, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, uh, and the Coast Guard. And the Air Force is the, the next one under there, which is the Community College of the Air Force, uh, their transcript. Um, talk a little bit about the DD-214. Um, another form called the DD-2586, the DOD TAP form. And then I wanted to talk just uh, at least briefly about some secondary effects of uh, what can happen when you award military credit and my experience with those. Um, so I've been doing this crazy enough for just a little shy of 10 years now. Um, so I've really started to figure out ins and outs and after all that time, it is still difficult, but hopefully I can alleviate some of your questions. So to start off with, uh, I wanted to lay a foundation for what the Joint Service Transcript looks like. Uh, so we have it pulled up here on the screen. Um, I don't know, Sarah, can you chime in and see, can you see the mouse pointer? No, I cannot. Okay, I'll do the highlighting and see if that works. So on the uh, top left of the transcript, we see the name of the service member. Uh, below that is their social, and then below that's their rank. Uh, that's kind of a fairly important field to get uh, to pay attention to, and I'll get to that in another couple slides. And then basically these transcripts uh, start off with uh, the section called military coursework. And then you see basically a course listed here with some credit hours attached to it. So the way this works is once a service member takes a course, generally this is uh, chronologically uh, ordered, so it generally starts off with basic training. Um, it'll actually have the, the military, whatever branch of service this transcript is for, their military course ID will be out here. And that number, uh, most of the time, you probably won't need to concern yourself with that unless you're trying to dig up a lot more information about the course. 
Um, so just kind of be aware of that. And that number can really change with no rhyme or reason sometimes. Um, the more uh, kind of steady number and the best uh, number to use for these courses is actually the ACE identifier, which I just highlighted, which for this particular course for that basic training is the AR-2201-0399. Uh, this says that V in the number is the version number. Um, so for here it says version zero. I think in the real world, I don't believe there's any version zeros. It usually starts with version one. Um, but this is their sample transcript that they share on the, on the website. Um, so basically, that's your uh, ACE identifier course. And as this course changes throughout time and gets updated or new credit is attached to it, um, this number uh, will generally stay the same, but that version number will change. It will become version 1, version 2, version 3, version 4. Um, pretty similar to the way, you know, if you accept an English course from another institution, you know, 10 years later it's probably going to change and you're going to award something a little different, but the course might actually have the same uh, title. So just something to be aware of. Um, next out here is the date when the service member took the course. And then there will generally be a, uh, the name of the course, basic combat training. You have a brief description of the course. And then there's the credit hour awards associated with this course. So for this one, for example, you have first aid, one hour, marksmanship, uh, one hour. Um, the physical training, physical conditioning here, one hour. The, and over here, sorry, you don't see the mouse. Over here is where you see the uh, semester hours associated with that course. Um, over on the right side, you see level. And right here you see L. That actually designates uh, L for lower level baccalaureate. So they have a few letters that they use. Uh, it starts with V for vocational. Then there's L for lower level baccalaureate. There's U for upper level baccalaureate. And then they also have a G for uh, graduate level. To my knowledge, I think those are the only identifiers they have. Uh, but most of the time, the majority of credit is either going to be the L or U uh, options. So I'll go to the next slide here. All right, after the military coursework appears on the transcript, uh, the next section you start to see is called military experience. And this, uh, I don't know if that's necessarily the best title for this, because uh, I think some institutions out there are um, a little hesitant and when they hear the word experience and credit. Um, but it's important to reiterate that this really is additional military training. Um, so I, I view this as this is the section where ACE, the American Council on Education, works with the JST folks and they put information regarding that service member's uh, experience with their occupational training. So the coursework sort of uh, from the first couple pages will lay the foundations for what they learned in their military school. And then they get to a duty station and they start performing their actual job, their duty in that field. And that's where this military experience is really coming into play. So it's showing you that they're staying essentially up to par in their field. Um, the best uh, comparison of this is essentially if somebody joined the military and they did, say, an, an IT occupation, and they went to you know, the IT school in the mid-90s, and as part of the school it recommends credit in like Windows 95, well, if you can look at their occupation code here and see that they were in that occupation from you know, 1995 until 2018, and it has the same uh, Windows operating system credit down here at the bottom, it's safe to assume that they are up to speed with the newest version of Windows uh, and they're not still in fact using Windows 95 type of thing. So this is really, I kind of view it more as a ongoing training. This is what they're doing every day uh, type of thing and staying up to speed with everything new in their field. So don't necessarily think just because some of the credit from the first pages might be old that they don't have more updated training. Uh, you just have to look at the dates on when they actually served in that uh, occupational field, and that will kind of help you uh, make that determination. And just uh, for example, just to read it off real quick, um, this was a human resource specialist example. Um, you can see many different credit hours listed under this person for areas such as business communication, office administration, 
uh, word processing, computer applications, uh, field experience and management, um, all those types of things. I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, I'm not going to pull up the web page, but we have the web link in here for the ACE Military Guide. So if you do not know what the ACE Military Guide is, uh, I would definitely recommend uh, spending some time on this web page. Um, essentially, you're going to need to use the ACE Military Guide uh, to look up more information about that coursework once you receive a transcript, the Joint Service Transcript. And I believe the link just got posted in the chat. So if you have a second monitor, you could even copy and paste that and pull it up. Um, essentially what that does is it breaks those courses down into two areas, which is courses and occupations. So depending on which section of the transcript you're looking at, you will uh, click on courses or occupations. And then you enter in, uh, you can enter in the AR number. So if we're looking back at that basic training course, enter in the AR-2201-0399. Um, it'll bring up multiple versions of that course, uh, version one, version two, version three, and then it'll have the different training dates. So that's where you need to uh, look at the training date next to the student, his actual transcript, his or her actual transcript, and then pull up um, the appropriate date that corresponds with the course. Um, so they might like this one, uh, where's the date range here? All right, right here, uh, the exhibit dates are from uh, 19, uh, July 1985 to uh, February of 2000. So if you get a transcript that has those dates, then you know you're looking at this right course. If they took it in uh, March or April of 2000, you would actually go to the next version. So you want version two. <coughs> So that's just to show you how that breaks it down via the version. Um, again, the course has the length, eight to nine weeks, and the hours. Um, the hours are actually pretty important uh, because the world of academia doesn't often understand what the military means by uh, their training hours and their length requirements for courses. And often what the military calls a course, most institutions would actually consider a short-term certificate or uh, even some type of a short-term degree because the hours are so drastically different. So uh, in some cases, if you say are wanting to have a course evaluated, and I'm just looking you know, at this one for an example, if I was to send this to say a, uh, a faculty member, I would explain this course was uh, eight to nine weeks. However, uh, the hour requirements 370 to 425. Um, once you explain that, you have to let them know kind of the military culture, that military environment that they're generally there all day long, every day, um, taking this coursework, unlike the college course where you're there a couple times a week for a couple hours. Um, so the hours are often uh, significantly higher than what we see in the normal world of uh, academia. And you can see down at the bottom, it has those same credit recommendations that we saw on the transcript. But you'll notice in the ACE version, instead of that short description and then credit recommendations, you now have at least a really brief uh, learning outcomes description, really brief description of instruction, and then the, the credit recommendations again. So this is generally your supplement to better understand uh, the actual transcript. So you're probably going to have that transcript pulled up for the student, then you're going to want to pull up the ACE guide to help you understand where this credit came from. Um, and looking at the uh, the occupation we looked at from the transcript, this is what the ACE guide has for it. Now what's interesting with this is when I said uh, when we first started that you need to pay attention to skill level, <coughs> um, it listed the person I believe as a E8 um, master sergeant. When you get down through here, it says you'll notice it has these credit recommendations for skill level 10 skill level 20, 30, 40, and 50. So that's based on the different rank that that uh, service member held. So for example, the, the 20, skill level 20 is the E5 level, the first uh, NCO level, and then you get E6 for 30, E7, and E8. So if that person on the transcript was an E8, they, get, they only get the credit recommendations for the skill level 50, but those recommendations incorporate all the previous recommendations and information. So as you're reading this description, you go through skill level 10, that's the lowest ranking individuals. 
So everybody, all right, everybody who's done this has that skill level. As they move up the food chain and get promoted and take on more responsibility, they then get to the next set of skill levels, skill level 20. As they get promoted and move up, skill level 30, so on and so forth. <coughs> so it's important to know um, how, how that's working. Um, somebody asked about the size. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought this was going to blow up a little bit better, but if you can, uh, these examples that I'm using are the same examples that um, ACE has out on their uh, website as samples. So you can click on them and kind of look through them as well. Um, pull up a, a PDF if you want. Um, they're on the Military Guide webpage. So this one is probably going to look <laughs> even worse. But this is the last, uh, essentially the last page of the transcript before um, the summary section. There's a long <clears throat> explanation of the transcript. So if you're new, um, new to doing this, or you know absolutely nothing about military rank and skill levels, um, just know that this section really breaks that down and explains it. So for example, the middle of this explains what I was just talking about with the Army and their skill levels in the rank system and how to be able to tell what credit gets awarded. So this is essentially their key, like a transcript key you would see in a normal transcript, um, but specifically for for the JST document, so everything's here. Um, the levels for credit that I mentioned earlier, um, they actually show up up here where it has the V and the L and the U and the G. That's all explained there as well. So worst case scenario, if you have questions and you don't remember something I've said or something you've learned in the past, um, this is a really good reference page to just kind of skim over and look and help you understand this transcript. All right, and then just as a, uh, an FYI, um, the Army used the skill level, something that's different in here about the, uh, the Marine Corps um, transcripts are, they are actually designated by rank. So you'll see when the, the transcript comes in from a student um, who was a Marine, and let's just say that student um, they held this occupation, this engineer equipment mechanic. And let's say they were an E5, a sergeant, just a plain sergeant. Um, this occupation might show up on their transcript, but then when you look at the actual uh, credit recommendations, you'll notice that each one in parentheses says uh, staff sergeant and above. So that person actually will not get any credit for this. But if you go back to that first page of the transcript and they are a staff sergeant or above, then they get this credit. So um, some of the occupations for the Marine Corps, it'll actually have uh, multiple things where it'll say, you know, this field staff sergeant and above gets this, staff sergeant and above gets this, and then the next one might say master sergeant and above gets this, and master sergeant gets this. Um, it really breaks it down by rank. So don't think, um, especially on the Marines, when you get into the occupational credit, that just because it's showing all of these credit hours, in some cases they actually should not get awarded all of those credit hours. Um, you have to make sure that you reference that rank from the first page and get familiar with their rank and pay grade uh, to really understand uh, how that works. So there's also, uh, to really get into the weeds with this, uh, I would definitely recommend if you're new or you're not very familiar with rank structure uh, that you go out, um, I didn't put the link in here and I probably should have, but if you just Google Department of Defense military rank structure and uh, print off a chart from a government page, um, I would keep that as a quick reference because in some cases there's actually ranks uh, that the, the Joint Service Transcript doesn't always catch. Uh, where there's overlap, so like a master sergeant and a first sergeant, um, their grades are essentially the same, but their job functions are different. So if that person got out as a, uh, as a first sergeant and their transcript says they were a first sergeant, and then you look at their experience and it says master sergeant and above, uh, it might not connect the dots for you, if you will, to understand that that person is supposed to get credit for that um, because their occupation they held was a little bit different. 
it's kind of like, uh, in the, uh, it's hard to explain, I guess, in the world of academics, it's kind of like somebody being a full professor and then also being the chair. Uh, that's kind of what a first sergeant is. They're also a master sergeant, but then they, uh, they're they essentially in charge of that whole unit, so they become the first sergeant, so they kind of hold both structures. So depending on when they exited the military and what rank is on the transcript, it's just something you need to be aware of to make sure you're awarding credit accurately. Um, those cases are somewhat rare, but in doing it, I would stumble across probably three or four a year um, when I was at a, a mid-sized university. Uh, where that issue would come up and somebody in records wanted to post all this credit and I would have to say, oh, no, it's this, or they didn't want to post anything and they actually were supposed to be posting something um, and they might get shortchanged quite a bit. So that's something to be aware of to uh, understand the rank structure that's listed. Uh, the Marines, I believe, are the only one that really have that where they list all of the credit regardless and then you have to actually make the decision and pick it. Um, I believe the Army, when they put it on the transcript, they actually post directly what's there. Uh, I don't know if that's a, a JST issue behind the scenes or if it's just the way that the old transcript system worked, um, but it's just something you need to be aware of that you pick the right pay and the right grade uh, to make that credit decision. All right, so the next million dollar question um, that you're going to get from probably faculty especially, uh, if you submit the, the ACE recommendations to them, um, they're going to see these credit recommendations and a really brief description, and probably the majority of faculty are gonna want more information. Now, within the last few years, the ACE guide has dramatically improved um, by adding fields such as those learning outcome areas. So the ACE course exhibits um, have changed quite a bit in just the last few years, and um, Hopefully that's kind of the result of groups like MCMC who have um, kind of constantly given them feedback on uh, issues they've seen with the transcript and issues they have with the, uh, the ACE military guide. And they do an excellent job of their process of reviewing these courseworks. Uh, they assemble faculty teams and go through all that. Um, and the whole point of that is, is to hopefully alleviate the need for duplicate evaluation of that course by your institution. However, I also understand in the real world that when they get this information, they're going to probably ask you specific questions. Well, you know, how long was this course, or what was the assessment used, or uh, um, what type of equipment was used, or did they have this certification or that certification, and those types of things. Um, sometimes you can ask ACE for that information, um, and they can easily look it up and, and give it to you, and, and other times it's a little bit harder to find. Um, so the, the methods of assessment, that's something else now that ACE has incorporated into a lot of the course exhibits, so that's a good um, checkbox that's kind of there. But if you still need some more information, um, <clears throat> the easiest thing is to, frankly, uh, just use Google or Bing, whatever search engine you prefer, and back on the transcript, uh, when you're using the ACE guide and you look up those courses, um, you'll notice that it actually had locations listed, so it would tell you where the service member took a certain course. So it could be Fort Benning, Georgia, um, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, uh, whatever, you know, um, Paris Island, South Carolina, whatever the, the case may be. It'll have that location listed. So if you essentially Google uh, the name of that military course and then that location, uh, many military schools and installations have their own websites, and in not all cases, but a fair bit, probably more than half, uh, actually have a little bit of course information out there uh, on their location pages. So, for example, a really good course that we've evaluated and we use across uh, the state of Ohio is the Naval Nuclear Power School. And so if you just search that school in the location, uh, the link I provided here, um, actually takes you straight to their page, and I did a screenshot of it, where it actually has the course broken down by the math area, the physics area, the radiation area, the chemistry area, uh, the electrical engineering, the thermodynamics, and the reactor engineering. Um, and it has the links to their, uh, their questions, the solutions, uh, the textbooks, the assignments. Um, this is probably one of the best um, schools as far as really documenting everything that's out there that the service member does, 
and definitely give credit to the Navy on that one. Um, they did a heck of a job with this website. And, and frankly, if I had to rate the branches uh, with the information with their schools, the Navy is certainly probably at the top of really putting the school information out there and then often having uh, coursework information or text information or assignments or something else posted out there that is excellent supplemental material um, that you can provide to faculty members uh, or whoever is, happens to be doing a course evaluation at your institution uh, to provide them that additional information. So now I'm going to shift gears a little bit from the Joint Service Transcript to the Community College of the Air Force Transcript. Now, just some really quick uh, information. Uh, in my experience of doing everything I've done with military credit uh, at an institution and now at a, a state level agency, um, starting off this process years and years and years ago, um, was thinking that the, the ACE recommendations were probably going to be the hardest uh, thing to lift and get done across you know, my institution as well as the state and that community college of the Air Force is going to be easy because it's regionally accredited. It looks like a regular transcript. Um, but that really hasn't been the case. Uh, the community college of the Air Force is definitely uh, in some ways a little bit more difficult to get equivalency information out of. Um, so if you're out there thinking just because they're regionally accredited, you know, I'm going to put this on the back burner because that should be easy. Um, I would definitely recommend if you're in that train of thought that you shift gears and put this to the forefront because uh, Community College of the Air Force is uh, in some ways more difficult than uh, the ACE guide and understanding the Joint Service Transcript. Now, one benefit of this is, again, it's a regionally accredited institution. When it comes to you, it looks fairly like a regular college transcript. Um, it'll have the, uh, the Air Force course information. It'll have what, you know, the, the Community College of the Air Force code, which uh, AMT and then four numbers, uh, it'll have a title and then the credit hours and then the, the grade. So essentially, for all intents and purposes, that really looks like a regular college transcript. You know, you would see English 1100, whatever title, credit hours, grade, um, great, grand, and marvelous. But something to keep in mind here is uh, their catalog. I put a link to it over here for their uh, 2017 to 2019 general catalog. So basically what you can do once you receive this transcript is you can pull up that catalog and that will provide you some uh, course descriptions, much the same way a regular college catalog would uh, for the Air Force coursework. The only downside is, is often those course descriptions are only two, maybe three sentences. Uh, in some cases it's only one sentence. Uh, to really describe what it is they're doing in that course. And then you're kind of in the same ballpark as you might have been with other military courses you've been evaluating of trying to get more information. So this is a little bit more blown up view of a Community College of the Air Force transcript. So I want to kind of compare this a little bit to the, uh, to the JST in the sense that uh, this right here, this weird little number and code system, is basically the Air Force code for that training program. And then below it are the Community College of the Air Force codes for the courses that are assigned to that training program. So you see MED 1306 and Nursing 1318 and, and these other two. But just know that this is the overall program that that person does. Once they complete it, they have these four courses assigned to them. So much the same way that you saw on the ACE transcript, that AR-2201-0399 for basic training, think of that as kind of the same as the ACE ID field. And then the credit awards are these actual courses that are listed. So keep that in mind. So I want to just distinguish different, and you'll see on the next slide why uh, that is. But these CCAF courses are embedded in that training program. Um, looking at that same transcript again and wanting to get more information, that code that I originally highlighted there uh, is really important. So the last uh, digits, generally speaking, the last four digits where you see uh, the red lines a little bit on top of it, um, 
but you see the 01AA. That is generally a uh, program code. You can kind of reference that in the, um, in the catalog. And then you have the rest of this information here uh, for this course. And what we want to focus on are really these last uh, five characters, this 4N031. So that's really breaking this program down into a, a specific career field and a training plan. So in order to find more information about this, um, they created what they call career field education and training plan documents for each of these areas. And just like the, I mentioned the, the Army and the Marines, all of them have this different rank structure and skill level. Uh, the Air Force has different skill levels too. You know, they go from journeyman to apprentice, they go through this whole chain um, where they go from a three level to a five level to a seven level to a nine and then a zero once they've kind of maxed out. Um, so this character where that zero is in the field, that will actually change depending on their skill level that they've completed at this point, so this zero um, represents a, a skill level in the field, or sorry, the, uh, the three, not the zero, the three represents the skill level in the field. And I tried to mention that by when they create the, uh, the training document, they create it and they say four in zero and they put an X as a placeholder and then a one, and as they go through the skill levels, the three, five, seven, nine, and zero, that number will appear in that X field on the transcript and you'll know what skill level that service member is. And then when you pull up that document, it has a, a lot of information in it uh, regarding what type of training they do to get to skill level three. And then it'll say, all right, now they've done all this extra training, they're at skill level five. Now they've gone to the seven level and they've done this. So it kind of gives you this cumulative sample of all of their training. But this is something that is not really mentioned or talked about in their catalog document because their catalog only focuses strictly on the CCAF courses. But you actually need to know kind of what program they were tied to so that you can get more information out of that. And again, those are the career field education and training plans. So if you kind of generally speaking just go and Google um, that career field. So for this particular case, I would Google CFETP4N031, or if you want to put an X there, you can put an X there. But if you Google that field, um, I put a link Jared? for one of the first. Yes. Um, before we move on, we've got a, a question. Um, and the question is, how do, do you di differentiate between training that's typically received on the job versus courses? And are military courses where they sit in the classroom and learn? Yes. So, all right. So this is easier to explain with the joint service transcript. So the very first section of the transcript starts off with that header that says military courses. So I personally view that as that is your, uh, you are attending a military school, you are sitting there butt in seat, and you are specifically learning whatever it is they are teaching directly in front of you. That is the military course section. Yes, and she just went back there. Highlighted right there. Starts off on the very first page. Now, depending on how many courses they have, it might be the next page or the third or the fourth page where you'll see military experience. That's where it shifts to uh, a little bit of on-the-job training. Uh, and I don't, I'm not a big fan of using that term on-the-job training, but it's kind of the closest thing that we would see to it. Um, and what I mean by that is, yes, it's on-the-job training, but if there's a, you know, in, in a situation where it's, say, you know, Windows 95 going to Windows 98 type of thing, I know that's an old example, but something like that, they're clearly going to have to actually go somewhere and learn a little bit of something to update that and learn that new material. Um, and the military typically, that's not going to be considered a whole new course in many cases. Sometimes it is. Um, but they view that as sort of their upkeep, that on-the-job training to keep you proficient in your field, essentially. Um, kind of, maybe it's kind of a mix of on-the-job training and continual, you know, continuing education type of a thing. Uh, in some cases, this, they are going to be learning new tasks or going to some short school. But overall, they broke it into the experience section just because uh, that is different from the actual courses. Uh, so just know that those are different. They have different ACE identifiers uh, attached to them. 
and they're in a completely different section of the transcript. So you'll see a clear break when it goes from a military school to their military occupation. So now back to um, the Community College of the Air Force. Uh, so in breaking this out uh, in a similar manner, um, I don't know if it's on either transcript, but uh, you'll see these are basically uh, courses here where you see this is what they learned. Uh, again, kind of butt and seat type of thing. And then right here at the very bottom, this is where it's sort of the on-the-job type aspect, where you see their, uh, the journeyman credit, uh, the rest of it's cut off. Um, but you'll notice it'll say INT 5000 journeyman. Uh, that's where you'll have to look at the trading document to see what their um, academic background is for that skill level. So you cannot put really an equivalency in a system that says INT 5000 will always be course X at my institution because that INT 5000 journeyman credit is literally different for every single uh, Air Force occupation. They have a different uh, education and training plan document for each one. You would have to pull that up and reference their code um, to see what their skill level is and then that would tell you what on-the-job on training they've done for that skill level. So that's sort of how it's different on the, on the Community College of the Air Force transcript. You'll see all these different courses, this section, and then at the very bottom, you'll see the journeyman credit listed, and that's, that's generally going to be your equivalent to on-the-job type of uh, information for that occupation. So going back to the, uh, the training plan document, I just uh, did a copy and paste of the very first page of the PDF so that you see it. So when you pull up this publication, um, you'll notice that it'll have the information up here, the 4N0X1X, uh, Aerospace Medical Service, um, the Career Field Education Training Plan. Uh, I believe this one is something in the 80-page range. Um, but as you scroll through there, you'll see all the different skills uh, and tasks that those folks have to do. And then in a couple of the pages, they'll have some charts where they break down, you know, this is what the the three level, the, the apprentice has to learn, this is what the five level journeyman has to learn or the seven level has to learn, um, and break that information down by skill level. So that's, these are probably the best supplemental documents you can get uh, from the Air Force unless you can actually get curriculum or something directly from a school, but in my experience that's been uh, almost impossible um, though not entirely impossible, but in many cases almost impossible to get the curriculum directly from the school. You have to kind of use the, the transcript, the catalog, and then these education training plan documents. And hopefully that can give you kind of the best um, overview of how to uh, award that credit and better understand it. Jared, so, we've got another question for you. Oh, okay. All right. So this one says, I'm not sure what attendees are uh, on this call, but WTCS schools are struggling with this topic. We are not sure what credit to award the military person. There's a transfer credit for but in seat courses and prior learning assessment for trainings. Okay, so this is, um, you know, this is where the institutions or a state, whomever, is going to hopefully help you make that decision. So. I think credit can be awarded for anything. You just have to decide what your institution, you know, which process you're going to be most comfortable with. So I've seen plenty of institutions where they will post everything for coursework, and then the, the experience section they'll want to do through a, a PLA, prior learning assessment option or an avenue. Um, in Ohio, we've, we've combined those two together, so we award everything together as one, um, and we kind of came to that agreement a few years ago. Uh, but in other states or individual institutions, if you don't have a statewide policy or something dictating what you do, then it's really an institutional decision. So, uh, and, and it really is going to depend on probably how comfortable your faculty are. And, and I would recommend getting somebody with a military background to help explain some of this to them uh, to really show them that, hey, this is what a course means, this is what their experience means, and explain the process. Now, you could always do something where you say, all right, we're going to articulate coursework and we're going to do portfolios, you know, prior learning assessment for the, uh, for the experience section, and then put some caveat in there that says, you know, after 
X number of portfolios are done if, if it's determined that the credit level, you know, the credit award recommended aligns with, you know, generally speaking, what we've been awarding, then we're just going to blanket, you know, include those in with our courses. Um, that's really kind of a, you know, individual school decision. Um, so, so it says not and given clear to direction from the state. I, I saw that. Um, okay. So you're getting measured based on the PLA awarded. Um, so uh, that, that's a tough decision. Um, so transfer credits aren't factored into that number. Um, so it sounds like I would recommend the uh, probably your registrar organization, maybe the WACRO, maybe approach the, the, the state and say, hey, we've all got together, we've decided that we want to do X, Y, and Z for this. Uh, will you be supportive of this type of uh, approach? Or explain the situation maybe to the, the state entity a little bit better and say that, hey, if we actually expedite this process and make it more beneficial for the service member, understand that your PLA numbers might be low. Or if we make this a little harder for the service member and do everything via portfolio, the PLA numbers might be really high, but then that kind of disadvantages the, uh, the service members. So that one's, that's tough. I'm not sure the best advice to give you on that one. Um, but I would definitely work with the state, the WACRO organization there, the uh, registrars and admissions officers, and see if you guys can uh, make some recommendations to the state. And Jared, we're uh, running close to time here, so not to tell you to hurry, but yep, I'm yep, yep. I'm here, gonna. So. <laughs> I will rush through. So the next one I want to talk about really quick, um, just as a FYI, is the DD-214. That is your certificate of discharge from the military. And you can see I try to throw in some humor where you can even buy a DD-214 blanket to sleep comfortably once you've been discharged from the military. Uh, in explaining what this is, this is a form that documents everything they did in the military. The majority of the time, you probably will not need this form to do anything with military credit. However, there are some benefits of looking at this form. The military is a massive entity. So the DD-214, keep in mind, is the absolute end-all, be-all for a service member's military record. The joint service transcript is only as accurate as what the military has most recently submitted to the JST folks. So it's always nice if you do have a DD-214 to verify a service member's pay grade and rank to make sure it matches what's on the JST. The DD-214 is the end-all correct document. So if this rank is actually higher than what's on the JST, I would encourage you to be comfortable enough with awarding credit based on the rank that's on the DD-214 because that is the end-all document. Um, I've seen this happen where it's uh, National Guard units especially, where a service member gets promoted and they haven't sent in the appropriate paperwork and it's literally been a year or two and the JST still says the previous rank and they're supposed to be getting awarded a lot more credits and it's not happening and we just use the DD-214 because that's an official government document that's more accurate. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is there are some other military education maybe mentioned here. Um, the, the only real notable one, Combat Lifesaver. Uh, that course uh, generally follows, uh, it, it, it's a lot of first aid, but it has some uh, CPR elements into it and they follow the American Heart Association standard. So some of our schools in Ohio, for example, they might use that for programs that require you to have CPR training. Now, with the only caveat being that uh, obviously their card or whatever has to be up to date, um, they might award the credit, but then they might still have to actually take an updated course to get the newest renewed card type of thing. And then uh, the other thing to show you on this document uh, is potential overseas time. Overseas deployments are going to be noted, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan you see on this document. The reason I note those is because some states, and, and Ohio is one of those, is where we're really trying to pursue how to award credit uh, based on deployment and pre-deployment training, uh, where the military really does some uh, cultural awareness training uh, and various aspects of uh, you know, what they're going to expect when they deploy overseas and how we fit that into general education. So the, the institutions that are awarding that credit, uh, they are generally using the DD-214 to verify that that service member has been to uh, country X or Y or Z uh, to award them appropriate credit 
uh, for a regional studies course or meet a multiculturalism requirement or a diversity requirement, something of that nature. So it's just kind of an FYI, that's, that's a good document to use to verify that and maybe award credit a little bit beyond the JST. Um, and again, if you have a veteran center or military folks on your campus, they can help you read the DD-214. It's a pretty standard document. Uh, veterans generally know what to look for on there and they can help point you uh, in the right direction. This next one, I just want to kind of go over really fast. Um, mo majority of the time, you're really not going to use it. Um, it's the DD-2586 uh, called the DOD TAP or the Verification of Military Experience and Training. Um, a service member can access this through eBenefits. So you're asking, when are we ever going to need to use this? This is in a situation where you cannot find anything whatsoever about a course that a student has taken that's on a military transcript, and this is your last line of defense to basically come back to that service member or student and say, hey, can you log on to your e-benefits and print off or give me this uh, verification of military experience training form, this DD-2586. What that does is it does provide uh, a PDF document of basically similar to the transcript. It'll list their courses. Uh, this is actually um, a screenshot of uh, myself, times on active duty. Um, it'll have it broken down into uh, other courses you've taken, um, notes uh, airborne school, and then it'll have a long description of that course. So the reason I put that in here and say it's your last line of defense kind of thing, uh, when to use, is because if you're looking at the, the ACE exhibit on this, and I know this isn't exactly the best college example, but it's the quickest example I've found, was that you know they're recommending three hours in physical ed, uh, everything's topics related to uh, parachuting and everything along those lines, um, but you realize it's only you know one two sentence description, whereas what's on the VMET document is essentially uh, a fairly long paragraph that really goes into detail about the equipment used, what you did, and everything involved with that course. So again, this is a document to use when you've tried to do your best with the ACE guide, you've done your best with Google or um, those types of things. Same thing with the Air Force. You've done your best and you just can't find the information you need. Um, this would be the last thing I would ask a student to say, hey, can you go out to your eBenefits account and uh, print off this VMET uh, document and see if there's anything out there we can use. Um, so that's the only reason I really wanted to mention that document. And last but not least, uh, I did want to say secondary effects of awarding military credit. So the issue becomes, in some cases, if you blanket award all this credit uh, and then they pursue a different degree program or whatnot, uh, they might be hitting what's called the, uh, the maximum time frame rule with satisfactory academic progress, which is known as the SAP 150% rule. Um, this has been a really interesting conversation uh, in Ohio, and I imagine it's been an interesting conversation in other states as well. Um, the federal aid only covers up to 150% of the degree, so once uh, credit's awarded above that, it kind of uh, uh, stops them from being able to be using federal aid. Um, so I actually copy and pasted the, uh, the handbook here for the most recent year, the 2017-2018 year. And what I wanted to mention is this portion that's highlighted on the screen. And you can kind of read this and I'll, I'll talk. Uh, so what happened in Ohio is many of the institutions are saying, uh, well, uh, the audience I talk to most frequently is the transfer folks and the advisors. So they were all saying that if we're awarding this credit, because uh, in Ohio we've kind of taken the stance that we want everything posted uh, uh, where possible to be shown on the transcript to really give them the best uh, you know, the best kind of hand up, if you will, and honor their service by posting everything to our transcripts. Um, but that might bring up SAP issues. And of course, the, the advisors and those folks were saying that this is happening, it's causing issues, they're losing financial aid. So I assembled all this information, the research I had, and took it to our uh, financial aid association here in Ohio and did a presentation. And at the end of the presentation, uh, the whole audience was pr pretty much looking at me very funny. <laughs> and uh, I kind of asked, all right, what's, what's going on? What's the issue here? And they kind of actually asked me, all right, hey, what's the issue? Uh, because we have appeals process in, in place. Uh, we've never seen this actually be an issue. And if it does come across as an appeal, we generally approve that. Um, we don't have any issue type of thing. 
so then it, we kind of realized in, in our case that it was actually a communications issue where many of the advisors and folks weren't even aware that an appeal process existed in most cases um, or that some of this credit that might not apply um, might not need to be applicable for the SAP policy. So it's really the school's discretion if they want to have that appeal process. So you can't really force your school to have an appeal process. So if you don't have that academic appeal process, then there might be some issues with awarding all the credit. If you do have the process, then probably should at least give them a heads up and realize, hey, if we're awarding all this credit, you might start seeing some appeals come across your desk with uh, military credit listed. So this often happens because service members might uh, uh, shift gears uh, and say they were a medic in the military and then they get out and they want to go through an engineering technology program or something. They might have 40, 50 semester hours of medical training attached to their transcript. And if you award that and then they start that program, pretty soon they're going to be hitting that 150% and not have hardly any of their program completed. So uh, that's something where an appeals process can handle that situation. But again, that's up to the individual institution. Uh, lastly, just some really quick information for those that might be having issues on campus or trying to get faculty to support this type of thing, just as an FYI, to keep in mind that ACE is a third-party evaluation service. So I often hear comments of when this started or other states that are starting it, the faculty say, hey, this credit's not regionally accredited, we're not going to take it. Um, well, understand that ACE cannot be regionally accredited. They're not an institution. They don't offer this coursework. They evaluate it through a contract with the DOD, and they hire faculty uh, from accredited institutions that have been teaching recently in these fields, and they get together, they form a consensus, uh, they give a credit recommendation and submit that. Um, so keep that in mind that the ACE process and that guide is there as a supplement for your faculty to hopefully prevent them from having to do the whole evaluation. Um, and hopefully, as good stewards and taxpayers, you're realizing that you're already paying taxpayer money to have them evaluate this once. Why pay to have it evaluated again? Uh, ACE does a pretty excellent job. And if you've ever talked to uh, faculty who have done those reviews, um, I think uh, if you did that, then faculty at your institution would probably feel a little bit more at ease. Uh, that's something we did in Ohio when we started a lot of this off. We invited uh, some faculty who have done these reviews with ACE here. And our faculty literally uh, kind of grilled them to the T of asking every question they could under the sun about what they do. And I think at the end of the day, they were really, really happy with the review process and the results. So now we have uh, pretty much statewide buy-in on this from faculty. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. And uh, again, I mentioned it earlier, if you're not aware, uh, Community College of the Air Force is a regionally accredited institution uh, through the Southern States Association known as SACS. Uh, so really, with Community College of the Air Force, in my opinion, there really shouldn't be any room whatsoever to not accept that credit. Now, depending on where you award it and apply it, that's still up to the institution, but uh, it is a regionally accredited institution, just like many other schools that we accept credit from. And then lastly, the big bullet point I really want to emphasize uh, that folks often say too is, well, I'd like to do this or award this credit, but HLC um, who's our regional accrediting body for most of the Midwestern states here, um, does not allow us to do this. Uh, that's actually a false statement. Uh, we've brought HLC here. We specifically sat in the room with them, asked them this question, and in fact, we asked it again um, probably less than a month ago, um, and they reiterated every single time that HLC does not prohibit the awarding of credit from any non-regionally accredited entity just that you have to have a policy in place that explains how you're doing it, why you're doing it, the background, and those types of things. Um, I would also say the same thing in my experience based on program accreditation. So ABET is a good one for the engineering folks. Uh, I actually sat down and had a good conversation with the president of ABET uh, and asked him this very question. He kind of said that's the same thing. It's a myth. Uh, as long as you have a policy in place, they do not prohibit uh, non-regionally accredited coursework from being utilized in any program. Um, the only one that's a little sticky that you would have to read up on, because I only know enough to be dangerous, is some of the ins and outs with uh, some of the social work specific accreditation. Um, they have some weird transfer policies, but the majority of military coursework does not come from fields in social work. So um, we really haven't had to deal with that too much here in Ohio, and I doubt most other states would too. Um, but again, I just wanted to reemphasize that in most cases, 
accreditation, whether it be the regional accrediting body or the program body, um, does not prohibit this uh, in any way. And now I just wanted to open it up uh, for some basic questions. Again, I, I really wanted to hit kind of the, the basic, basic points and the weeds and go over this stuff. Uh, I'm certainly willing to present or have conversations with people. Uh, my email's up there, so by all means, feel free to uh, shoot me an email if you want to talk more or want me to explain something a little bit more on the phone. I'm certainly willing to do that. Um, I came earlier this year, did a presentation to some of the folks in Wisconsin about what we've done in Ohio. Um, so I can certainly travel a little bit if need be, um, but uh, I'm really here to help. I help all of our institutions in Ohio. Uh, we're focused more on the public institutions, but I also answer a lot of questions for the private schools as well. Um, and I think that's it. I'll, I'll open it up for questions, see what people think. Thank you, Jared. We really appreciate uh, your presentation today. Um, just as a reminder, if you do have questions, please submit them through the chat feature. And uh, something else I'll, I'll mention while we wait on questions to get in is that uh, another good area that this information can be used is actually in the career service areas of your institution. So the military transcript, although we use it to uh, articulate credit in the world of academics, um, ACE does an excellent job of explaining what the military did in their credit recommendations in normal civilian language. So if you have a service member who's really struggling to build a resume and that, back, that background of what they did in the military, the Joint Service Transcript is an excellent document to tell them, hey, put this on your, on your resume and use these terms that they use for your credit hour recommendations. Um, and I've seen that be a, be a very powerful tool for helping them build resumes, especially for service members who were in combat MOSs like infantry or artillery, and they think, oh, all I did was shoot a gun all day. Well, the ACE document really gives them some additional language to use um, that's a little bit more prominent in what you would see in a resume versus just saying, I was in the infantry. So look okay, at- Okay, Jared, we've uh, got um, a couple questions here. I think we probably got time uh, for these last two before we have to close okay. the webinar. The first one is, how do you go about identifying faculty who have served on ACE review committees? Okay, that's more of a question for uh, the ACE folks, but in the military guide area um, on their page, they have some contact information, and I think the person who handles some of that is actually on this webinar right now, um, Michelle Spires. Uh, we, as a state, reached out to her at ACE and asked, hey, can we get a couple of faculty members who have done the review process to come? And that's how we did that's how we did that process and got in contact with them. We also asked them, you know, what faculty in Ohio were participating in this. So you could also do that for your state too. Ask, hey, do we have any faculty in our state already doing this and we just don't know about it? All right, thank you, Jared. And the next one is regarding the SAP information. Was the info on the slide from a government financial aid source? Such as yes, only transfer credits that can't, okay. Yes, the link from that was on the previous page, and that's actually to the Federal Financial Aid Handbook for the 2017-2018 uh, year, whatever the most recent year is that they have posted. So that is from the government webpage out there. And that's why I said it's, it's a really interesting conversation to have because I think a lot of people don't realize what those requirements actually say and that the schools have a little bit more freedom than they might think. Um, but again, those are institutional decisions. Um, that your institutional financial aid person would have to answer. Great, thank you, Jared. Well, we've got um, just a few seconds here left. Uh, this gives me enough time to thank everyone uh, for joining us today on the webinar. Uh, you can always go back and review past MCMC webinars if you have questions or you want to go back and uh, review some of those. And the, um, today's webinar will be put on our YouTube channel, and the slides that you saw today will also be emailed to you um, shortly. So thank you so much for joining us, and again, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.